In this video, we're going to talk about the economics of housing vouchers. So some countries use housing vouchers as a way to ensure that all families can have access to affordable housing. For example, in the United States, we have a program called Section 8. And Section 8 provides vouchers to low-income families to make sure they can get housing. And the way that Section 8 works is this. So for a given neighborhood, uh, you assess what is the fair market rent for that neighborhood. And then the tenant, he or she is going to contribute 30% of his or her income toward the fair market rent. So let's pretend that the fair market rent for a neighborhood was $1,200 and that the tenant, 30% uh, of his or her income, let's say that that is $400. So what's going to happen is that, that $1,200 fair market rent, we're going to subtract the $400 that the tenant pays and that's going to leave a shortfall of $800. There's going to be $800 left that the, the tenant can't afford. And the voucher, the Section 8 housing voucher, is going to cover the remaining amount. So that $800 is going to be a subsidy. Right? That's a subsidy from the federal government. So we have this subsidy, and that's going to cover part of the rent. So $400 comes from the tenant, and then $800 would come from a subsidy. So that's how housing vouchers work, at least in the U.S. So I want to show you now the effect that this would have on supply and demand in terms of the market for housing. So let's think about this. If we have, let's say that our initial quantity of housing in an, in an area happens to be, let's say, 5,000 5, units. Let's say there are 5,000 units. This is at the equilibrium. So we've got supply and then we've got demand. Right? So our equilibrium we have 5,000 is our quantity of housing. And then our initial price, let's say, is $700 a month or thereabouts. So if we have an initial quantity of 5,000 and then we have an initial price of 700 and we say, okay, we're going to introduce these vouchers. Vouchers are going to make it easier for more people to obtain housing. That's the goal of the vouchers, is we want people who before couldn't afford housing, maybe they're homeless, maybe they were doubled up living with relatives. We want to make it so that they can get housing. Or maybe they want to move into a new area, etc. But we're going to be increasing the demand for housing. That's the whole goal. That's what we're doing here. We're going to increase demand for housing. So here's our new demand curve, D2. So we had our initial demand curve, D1, and we are shifting to D2. We're shifting the demand curve outward. So what's going to happen? Now we've got a new equilibrium. Our new equilibrium is right here. And so now our equilibrium, our, our new quantity, it's going to be our new quantity, is going to be higher. Eh, let's just say that it's 6,500. So it's going to be higher than before. And I'm just pulling these numbers out of a hat. So our new quantity of housing is higher than our old quantity, our initial quantity, before the vouchers. Well, hey, it worked. That's what we wanted, right? We wanted to get more people into housing, and, and so this makes sense. Now, what happens to price? So let's look for, from our equilibrium here, and let's go outward. So we say, okay, let's go and extrapolate this over to our y-axis, and now we've got our new price of housing. Well, we can see immediately the new price is higher than the old price, the initial price before the voucher. So let's just say that it's $900 a month or something like that. So you see that the 900 is higher than the 700. So what has happened here? Well, we've introduced these vouchers, so we've made it easier for people to get housing. So we've increased the equilibrium quantity of housing. That has gone up because our demand curve shifted to the right. We've also increased the price because we have more people now who are entering the market for housing. If the price didn't go up, then we'd have a shortage, right? So landlords are going to say, oh, okay, well, there's more people now wanting to buy housing. They've got vouchers, and so we're going to increase the price. That's what happens. Now, you might be wondering, well, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I mean, we're intending to make housing more affordable. And now the price is going up. So what is going on there? And then I will leave to you whether it's a good or bad thing, but here's a justification for why that might not be a serious problem. We might have a situation with our market for housing 
where housing, affordable housing, can be viewed as a situation where there's a positive externality. I have another video on positive externalities if you want to check it out, but let me just give you the basic idea. So when families are able to obtain affordable housing, there are certain benefits that come from having affordable housing. So people who get affordable housing and couldn't afford it before, let's say before they were in a homeless shelter, it didn't have to be a homeless shelter. Maybe they were living with relatives or whatever, but they didn't have stable housing. And then now we get them into housing because now the housing has become an affordable option to them. It also could be that they were in a rough area, it was high crime, and now we got them into a better area. A number of things could happen, but the idea is that we get them into a better situation housing-wise. Now, when we do that, when we get them better housing, if they have children, for example, their children might be more likely to graduate from high school. And if they graduate from high school, they're going to probably have a higher lifetime earnings. They're gonna have higher lifetime earnings. They're going to, that means they're gonna be a more productive worker. We're gonna have a more productive workforce and they're also less likely to engage in crime. And they're going to have lower health care costs. There are a number of benefits, right? Because now they've got the affordable housing, maybe they're out of a bad area, or they're not worried about being shuttled around from homeless shelter to homeless shelter so the children can focus in school. And so we have these different benefits. We have these benefits that come from having affordable housing. But here's the issue, and this is the nature of the positive externality. When a family is considering, when they're making the decision of whether to buy housing, not to buy housing, et cetera, they're having different, they're only considering their private benefits. All of us consider our own private benefits, our own private costs and benefits when we decide to do anything, to buy a car, to take the train, et cetera. And so when we consider our private benefits, we can map this out as a demand curve or I can just, I've got MPB here, marginal private benefit curve. And then we've got our marginal uh, social costs, right? So we can think about the marginal social costs, the marginal private benefits that gets, and, and or you could just think of the marginal social cost or marginal cost, it's however you want to think about it. Our equilibrium for the amount of housing that would be demanded would be we'd have a QM. So let's say, I'm just going to throw out some numbers here. Let's say that's 8,000 units of housing and that the price is let's say 750 a month. So here's our equilibrium. But here's the nature of this positive externality. The marginal social benefit, that curve is actually higher. That's to the right, right? The marginal social benefit of people being in affordable housing is higher than the private benefit to that family. And here's why. So if we think about the family, and we talked about all the benefits, a higher graduation rate uh, and so forth, and uh, lower crime, that helps the family that's in the housing. Clearly, they're better off if their child graduates from high school, but so are the neighbors. The neighbors are better off as well if the child graduates from high school, doesn't commit crime, and so forth. Everyone's better off. Society, society enjoys these benefits not just the private individuals who are making the decision whether or not to get housing. And so, actually, our socially efficient level of housing would be here. I'm just going to call that QE. That's the socially efficient level. And then our price at that would be PE. And so our equilibrium, if we were at a socially efficient level, we're considering the costs and benefits, not just to the individual family, but to all of society, the socially efficient equilibrium would be right here. And we're not there. So what we can do, see this difference in price? What we can do is we can have a subsidy. We can subsidize the families to encourage them or enable them to invest in housing. So as we get them into housing, we move toward our socially efficient equilibrium. So this QM and PM, that's the, this is the equilibrium here if we just let the free market work. But we have a market failure. We have a market failure whenever we have any type of externality. And in this case, it's a positive externality because the individuals who are making the decision of whether to buy, not to buy housing are not capturing all the benefits. 
right? There are benefits that accrue to all of society, and so we want to get to this equilibrium here. And so by subsidizing the family, we can get to that equilibrium. Now, as you've seen, it increases the price, but we're getting to the socially efficient or optimal level of housing.